So now we understand more clearly the framework and the underpinnings of our republic. What was it that Franklin feared would destroy the republic? And I find it interesting that a man of that caliber knew when they came out, they knew that what had happened was most unusual and, and, and allowed of God to happen. Which is why he was so quick to say, we've given you something really special. But you have to work at it because the natural tendency is for it to disappear. What did he fear? He simply feared people who would embrace a worldview that opposed those two pillars the founders erected. The biblical worldview of God and the view of law being above the king. This opposing worldview has taken many forms over the years. Today we would call this the postmodern worldview. The operative worldview, this one, dominates government today. It dominates the political system. It dominates public education, much of science, the legal system, and medicine. This postmodern worldview rejects God and rejects absolute truth. It denies creation and embraces pragmatism in an ever-changing ever moral code. From this worldview arises the, the rejection of the concept of law over the king and a practical repudiation of the Constitution as our highest civil law. So, which is why you can have so many who will take the oath of office and then proceed immediately to ignore it, to abandon it, to pretend as if they had never made it. Because if truth is not absolute, then who cares if you say it doesn't apply today? That's pragmatism. That's moral relativism. That's why you see happening what's happening. You look to Washington and see what are some of the actual workings out of this. Well, I mentioned a couple at the beginning. I mean, you have a president who is in office, who despises the Constitution and the rule of law is the furthest thing from humility, the epitome of arrogance, believing that he is the law, which we all know attempts to make it happen every day or every week through executive orders and challenges the legislative branch or anybody else to call him to task. There's a despising of the rule of law. It is in fact really truly king over the law. But because you have so many else who are there who despise their constitutional oath and don't think that they are the gatekeepers of our freedom, compromise away their positions. And so you have a Congress that has sat there for five years. And up until this last lousy budget which they passed, they had no budget. They didn't know how much money was being spent because there was no budget. Who cares if government steals from the people, spending what they do not have, printing fictitious dollars, destroying the future of our children? If pragmatism rules, king over the law. So now you have a Congress that because they have sat for so long and allowed the king, the man, to think he's king, to go unchallenged, they have so weakened themselves. The Congress really doesn't have a whole lot of authority, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Obamacare we suffer under, passed by Congress. Even the majority that's in the House, own Republican majority, in my opinion, have not done what they should have done in the defunding but think rather one time it'll get so bad that maybe people turn their backs on what kind of leadership is this? On morality, every moral underpinning of all that we have, both the view of law, the integrity of life, the integrity of marriage. Who cares what God says? We'll do what we want. 
man becomes law. So lastly, with the pillars underpinning our republic under attack, what must we do to keep it? Well, frankly, in a practical sense, we have to shore up the pillars that hold it up, or it will fail. We've, we must aggressively support and defend the structures of society as established by God. Now, what are they? The family, it is civil government, and it is the church. In the simplest terms, those are the three legs under every stool of society in the history of mankind, because that's what God established. And what did he do first? It was the family. And there is a clear definition of the family. It is one man and one woman and children. That's the family. And God not only gave that, he said, Father, you're in the home. And you've got a role. If you do it right, your children will turn out right. And you can have an impact on your grandchildren. The next generation can pick that up and go on. But if you do it wrong, or you're not there, then your family will fail. And that institution fails. A leg under the stool fails. The church, a very specific role to play, separate from government. This is true separation of church and state. Not God from government, but that the church exists and the government's not to stick its nose into it. Right. There is then civil government, which God created, in order really to protect, to make sure that the other two could do what they were given to do. Not to tell them what to do, but to protect what they were to do. That really, in true sense, is the essence of limited government. It's not the kind of government we're talking about today who wants to take and regulate everything that we do and every aspect of our lives. It's not that at all. Together, this means defending the life of the unborn and the lives of all. Because without life, there is no family. And with no family, there is no society. God's definition of marriage and family must be preserved and defended because it's the best and it works. This means protecting private property and the freedom of religion and speech. This means that men must start acting like men and fathers like fathers. This means that those in office must preserve and strengthen the laws that support these pillars. Life, and marriage, and responsibility. It also means that those in the pulpit, in the church, must preach this necessity and how to do it. Because those in the pulpit, in the church, play a critical role in that they must do their part to speak out in defense of the family and of life and of limited government and the rule of law. We must all oppose tyranny wherever it's seen. You know, we all look for someone to stand up in the defense of freedom. We wonder where they are. I'll tell you where they are. Those positions, those leaders, they're to be found in the home where there's a father. In the civil government, where there's a person who understands these things, and the pastors in the pulpit, because those are the positions of influence. Those are the positions that determine whether or not you have a healthy family, or a healthy church, or a healthy government. And finally, as William Penn made so clear in his frame of government, even if, even if, you have the best form of government, a constitutional republic, it ultimately depends on the people in government who know who God is and disciplines their actions according to the commands of Scripture as Penn said, the Ten Commandments. 
and keep their promises to operate under the highest civil law, the Constitution, and the highest moral law, God itself. We have to have people in office who know these things and do as God expects. And as Penn detailed and our founders knew, those in office have to be people of integrity and character. Is there hope for our nation? Can we save the republic that we love? Frankly, folks, this republic and this nation is in real trouble. The pillars of truth have been undermined. There is no more truth. Truth is relative. The law has become man, not the Constitution. God, who's he? Whatever you want to make him to be. The very foundations of freedom are being attacked, and we stand here today on very, very shaky ground. But the question is, should we give up? I know we're all tempted to. We all get worn out. Who doesn't? We get worn out. But is the option to just cover our eyes and put our fingers in our ears no, no, and say, no. yeah, the answer is no. no. There's too much that rests upon that. I talk regularly with key individuals around the country who have much understanding of the kinds of things I've shared. And I'll say most have come to this conclusion. One, the federal government, Washington, D.C., has become fully corrupted. Yes. And it's not capable of writing itself. Two, there's no human way even if everyone in America would miraculously awaken tomorrow morning and say, we have really gone the wrong direction and, and, and say we've, we've recognized the error of our ways, and they, they decided at that point that we need courageous Christian statesmen in office. Even if that were to happen, you're not going to see a majority change in 2014 or 2016. And why do I say that? Because at this moment in time, there aren't enough horses in the stall to run the race. <coughs> they don't exist at this point. Truly qualified people in these quantities simply aren't there to claim a majority and to turn back all that we have lost. And beyond that, even if you could change of that magnitude, there have been such structural changes made in the law and other things that you could automatically turn it back right away anyways. Now, that's not to say there is no hope. But in a practical sense, my direction, being with the Pastors Network now, which is where I'm spending time, as well as working with what I'd say the good guys in office and encouraging guys who believe these things to run, my folks have shifted somewhat to this. We all hope everything can be turned back tomorrow, but it's not going to happen for the reason I just said. It's not. Many would believe in real practical terms that we have not hit bottom in this country yet. I tend to share that. There are too many people who still believe and trust in what they have in the bank, which is disappearing. And if the dollar does its thing that the Federal Reserve has set up, it'll disappear even faster, and that may be the thing that awakens the people of this country. But we don't change our direction unless we change in where and whom we place our trust. We're not here because of this government. This government is here because of people in the past who trusted God, like what happened in Philadelphia. And the recognition that we're not here because people were smarter, people were stronger, people were richer. We're here because we people recognized years ago that we needed God's help 
and the concept of self-government could be achieved, where we didn't need a tyrant telling us what to do, only if we acknowledge this worldview. My practical approach is this. I'm focusing on the 10%. The 10% of those in office, the 10% of those in the pulpit, the 10% of the people on the ground, because I really think that's about the number that there is. I think, I think that's pretty close to what it is. That's a remnant. That's not a majority. But take heart. There wasn't a majority when those were at the beginning of our country's founding put their names on the Declaration of Independence. They weren't in the majority. Others followed them. God has never used a majority. It's always been a small number. So never be discouraged because not the majority. But I think that 10%, if they actually stood up and said, here's the truth, here's the history, here's the direction, here's what we will do. Constitution, God's law, moral law, we recognize it, we subscribe to it, we're going to follow it. And the last thing, understanding that as in the days of our founding, change did not come from the top down. Change came from the bottom up when the people understood. I'd like to share with you in the next few minutes something that I am sharing with pastors across the state. And I'm sharing it with legislators as we are convening and calling together legislators and pastors. Sharing some of the same things I've gone through say, hey, look guys, you're in a position of authority in office. Do you understand that? And we're laying out the concept to those in office that they are there in a position of leadership, civil government, but under God's economy, they are called a minister of God. Most of them don't even know that. That God will hold them accountable. Not just the people in an election. It's far bigger than that. There's a moral obligation to what they do. And the pastors in the pulpit, most of whom are afraid to speak on anything that they hear in the news because it's political, which is one of the biggest ruses that the enemies of freedom have been able to implement to prevent those who are the ones to enunciate the truth, to keep them bottled up and don't touch the very area they are obligated to instruct. So we call together these pastors and these in office and say, hey, look, do you know what the Bible says? Do you know what the founders believed? Do you understand that in your position of authority, that it's God-ordained authority? That you have a responsibility that transcends the moment. It's not a job. It's a duty. It's a, it's, a, it's a responsibility. It's a part of what God intended from the beginning to keep these three legs under the stool functioning. Pastor, this guy in office, he's in office because God put him there just like he put you there. The guy in office, the pastor over here, he's not just somebody who can just drum up some votes at election time. He's somebody who has a moral obligation under God to also do the same thing you're supposed to do. That's lift up the truth. Execute justice in office and do what God says government is supposed to do. Now, that relationship now, see, is no longer political. That's biblical, which is exactly the way it was at the founding of our country. Many of you are aware, uh, but it was the pastors in the pulpit that prepared the ground. That, that allowed and taught and precipitated those who ended up putting their names in that Declaration of Independence. It was the pastors in the pulpit who were the ones who stood up and taught and spoke out against tyranny. I ran across a sermon just sometime just recently and I read it was an amazing thing uh, how, how these pastors spoke more against tyranny than they did even for freedom. But they've laid the way. Our addressing the problems of today are not a whole lot unlike what was needed back at that point. There was a king. He was a tyrant. There was a violation of unalienable rights. Now what do you do about it? We sit here the recipients of those who went about it the right way. And they gave us something rather unique. 
if you can keep it. Life, nations like life is in a cycle, it comes around. It's come around to our time. It's nothing new. We shouldn't think that we have not, people of the world have never seen this before. They have. The question is, are we going to respond in an equal fashion, calling upon the power that God can give and understand how we got here? The postmodern worldview has robbed from the American people our history and robbed from us our strength. If we do not believe that God rules in the affairs of men, or that moral law reigns supreme, then frankly, what hope much do you have? A French Revolution? Not my idea of anything successful, and it wasn't. That's what made ours distinctively different. So if you don't mind, we're going to start this few minutes late. 15 minutes yet? Most? I want to show you what I am presenting to our pastors and our legislators. I hope you can read that. <clears throat> this is a part of a larger presentation that I've done thousands of people so far. It's called Rediscovering the Foundation. But this little piece right here is a part that's focused on government. Let me just walk through this with you. And I think it'll help. Hopefully, it'll take and put together some pieces. The question, from where did the founders get their ideas and convictions about God and man and, gov and government? Answer is, it was from God. And what was their foundation? It was the Bible. Now, that being established, let's go and see what does the Bible say? What did our founders believe? What was the foundation under which gave us this republic and the Constitution? Well, first of all, the origin. Where did it come from? Government's God's idea. God works through government and nations and leaders to accomplish his plan. Now, I'm going to give you some Bible verses. You're going to say, all right, Sam, come on now. I'm tired. I'm not going to preach at you. I'm giving you these things. Because these are the underpinnings of our history. These are the sources of what became what we now have. And unless we understand that this is what our founders understood, and that this is the basis for what will bring us back to a proper republic, we'll never get there. The world, the press, all that says, don't talk about these kinds of things. There's no place in society. Well, of course they don't want to talk about it because they were successful in taking it away. This is the old book, uh, the Old Testament. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Again, this is biblical worldview, obviously. That's what we're talking about. Secondly, God blesses and judges nations according to how they follow his command. God will judge all nations who forget him. Deuteronomy 8 says, And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, and I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, this was given to Israel when they went in the land, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Now, a lot of these verses I'm giving you here, you will find engraved on the walls of our capitals in Washington. God will erase from history all nations who neglect his warnings. Psalm says, The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget him. We know that by God, nations rule. Acts 17. This is a very interesting verse. God who made the world and all things therein hath made all nations to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the events before appointed and the limits of their habitations. The reality that God is not just there as an inactive God. 
God was there in the making of this, of this nation of ours. But more than that, this God knows about the nations of the world. Matter of fact, their geographical boundaries were determined. Whoop. Okay. All those in government are there by permission. Very important concept. Proverbs says this, For by me kings reign and princes decree justice. He takes down leaders and he sets up leaders. The concept that those who are in office are not there by accident. They are allowed. Daniel, book of Daniel says, He removeth kings and he setteth up kings. We don't have an inactive God like the deist thought. He started the clock and then walked away. That's not what most of the, majority, the, the founders believe. That's not what the, what the scripture says. Now, the definition of government, what is it? That was the origin. The definition is this. It literally means the exercise of authority over the actions of men and commu uh, communities, societies, states, parents, or households. In the broadest sense, government encompasses anyone or any entity that exercises authority over somebody else. So when you say the word government, it means authority, but literally... It's the parents in the home. It's the teacher in a classroom. It's the employer who has employees underneath of him. <coughs> it is those in public elected office. It's anybody who has somebody underneath. That's literally the, that's the definition of government. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. Those underlying words, rule, authority, and power, all come from the same Greek word. It all, all means the same thing. Ephesians talks about we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. The same word. Same word for government. Now, God just didn't establish this and walk away with no plan. William Penn referred to the model. Well, the model he referred to, and you read a lot of Penn stuff, he pulls out these things I'm even talking about. The plan is that government... All authority in government is ordained by God and instituted by Him. That's in Romans 13, the New Testament talks about that. God established four foundational levels of government. First was self-government. That's what Penn talked about. That's the very bottom, most fundamental element, individually. But then created the family, and then civil government, and then the church. God the Father delegated all government or all authority to Jesus Christ. Now walk, watch me go through this. is very interesting. Isaiah 9, 6. We just passed Christmas, right? Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government, literally means the empire that will prevail, shall be upon his shoulder. This was Old Testament talking about Christ, of the increase of his government and authority and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with justice, judgment and justice, even forever. It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We say this verse a lot. You heard a lot during Christmas time. Well, it ties into this whole concept. All authority or governments are given unto me in heaven and earth, Christ said in Matthew. So, God the Father's the plan, the origin, lays it out, and then he gives all authority to Jesus Christ. Now, since God is the author of all government or authority, and Jesus Christ alone is the sovereign, singular source of power and source of all power and authority, that's established, what Scripture says, our founders believed, Revelation 19 says this, Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. All fitting into the concept of government and why this is what it is. So we sing about it. We don't have to put it together how it fits. Therefore, God's law, Lex Rex, is above all law. See how it fits? 